Thanks for joining us again. Another one of our Safer at Home series talks. Very nice to have you with us. Um, hope everyone is uh, um, uh, enjoying the fact that spring is coming. We're, we, we've now we've we've now entered uh, at, at least meteorolo meteorological spring, so that you know the, the winter is coming to an end. Um, so. Um, uh, before we get started tonight, I um, uh, want to thank our sponsors, Cape Cod Five, First Citizens Federal Credit Union, Martha's Vineyard Savings, and uh, uh, like all the books uh, that are part of our series, um, if you um, go to Eight Cousins Bookseller in Falmouth, uh, they will have copies of this on hand. If you're not a member, thank you for, for joining us tonight. We really hope that you uh, consider becoming a member to the Falmouth Historical Society Museums on the Green. And one other thing too, I don't, I don't have it on my little slideshow, but if you're interested, and again, with spring coming, I want you to make you aware of some things, but uh, um, hopefully if you get our e-blast, you'll see that on the first and third Fridays of each month, weather permitting, um, we're, gonna, uh, we're gonna do our walking tours of Falmouth. So that's at 10 o'clock. So if you're interested in uh, stretching your legs a little bit and getting some fresh air and you're tired of being cooped up, that's, that's an alternative. So. Um, uh, thanks for that. Um, we've had some uh, some pretty exotic locales uh, as part of our Safer at Home series, and I'm, we're glad that people can can join us from wherever. This is another exotic locale. Perhaps you've heard of it. It's called Martha's Vineyard, and um, um, our speaker tonight, Thomas Dresser, has written 19 books. Tom, I think it is. I was counting. Um, he's a local historian. Um, um, an, an author from from Martha's Vineyard, and we're uh, thrilled to have him join us tonight. So, would you welcome our guest tonight, Thomas Dresser? All right. Well, thank you very much, Mark. Um, I appreciate the number of books that you think I've written, but uh, I don't think it's quite at that number. I have uh, published about twelve books on vineyard history. And the one we're going to talk about tonight is my lucky 13th. Um, I'd like to start off, though, just by saying how much Falmouth is part of my life. I spent three years there working. Uh, I was the administrator of Royal Nursing Home right on uh, Main Street. And I commuted back and forth and really enjoyed the experience. I also uh, visited you. Um, maybe eight years ago, when we did a, a, a book on World War II, and I believe you had a, a very interesting exhibit, and I uh, think I took a picture of a blackout curtain that you had in a room, and I think that's in my book on World War II on Martha's Vineyard. So uh, just as a as a background, I am familiar with you, and every time I go over to America, we take the Woods Hole Ferry, and so we traipse right through your little community. Very darling, and we go there especially uh, during the holiday season to see how the village green right in front of you is all decorated and put together. So what we're going to talk about today is Ghosts of Martha's Vineyard, and I uh, put this book together last year, but uh, it took a while for me to be convinced that I should write about ghosts because my work has been, with the vineyard histories, it's been exclusively dealing with hard facts, all nonfiction stuff that you can research, you can interview people, you can take pictures of, and it's something you can get your hands around. And I had to be convinced that there are ghosts. And it was sort of a very strange experience for me to go from a non-believer to someone who's curious to someone who has a sense that uh, maybe there is something out there. Now I have a two, two admonitions before we get started and one is not to be an alarmist, but this is March 4th, and this is the day that we used to inaugurate our presidents, and there's a conspiracy theory flying around that we um, 
face some problems in the United States Capitol. So far, I don't think anything has happened today. I'm not a QAnon person, so I'm not really putting too much faith in that. Thank goodness. Um, the second thing I want to uh, worry you about or warn you about is that when I first did a book talk on the ghosts of Martha's Vineyard, it was last October, and it was for the Edgartown Public Library. And it's always sort of exciting to do the first talk because it's like, this is what it's going to be all about. And you're prepared and you have everything ready. And I was introduced just as uh, Mark introduced me. And I started to talk and suddenly my desk lamp right in front of me flickered a little bit. And it sort of, bothered me. Maybe the bulb was loose or maybe I kicked the, the plug underneath. It flickered again. And then the printer that is connected to my computer started to turn by itself. I didn't push any buttons. It just started. And I tried to ignore it. But then the phone rang and the phone is right near my computer. And I had these three things happening and then the Zoom connection fluttered and died out. Now I worked with the director, we tried to get things back up, but it really did not happen. We had to close out business after four or five minutes. And it was in one way very frightening because it was like something else is happening around here. On another level, it was kind of amusing because I was doing my first book talk on ghosts. I wasn't talking about World War II on Martha's Vineyard or African Americans on Martha's Vineyard or a shipwreck or a murder or whatever on Martha's Vineyard. This was something ethereal, ghostly, something we couldn't put our hands around. And so it was an auspicious beginning. And the next week I did another book talk and everything went smoothly. So from that point on, I've really handled it okay. We'll do our best now to um, make things work out the way they should. And what I'm going to do is uh, change my screen so I have a screen share and let you see what, uh, what I have to show you, what I have to share with you, and we'll see if we can get it to work properly. So this is called Ghosts of Martha's Vineyard, Spooky Stories to Share Throughout the Year. And I have the correct date here, I guess, and we'll see where we go. So Ghosts of Martha's Vineyard, and you put a nice little promo up a couple weeks ago. So I know this is the book, and I know this is the date and the time and so forth. And we start off with the museums on the green. And you've got two or three buildings right there. And it's just a very impressive arrangement sitting there right on the green. And I was able to take these pictures a couple of weeks ago when I um, came through town and it had just snowed and everything looked very pristine. Now to ease you, before we ease you across the water, uh, I just want to uh, show you or tell you how impressed I was when I took a little walk up to um, Highfield Hall uh, by the B.B. Woods. And if you're a Falmouth residents, you can tell me a lot more about it than I can talk to you about. But I find it um, very interesting that this impressive building uh, from the 1870s is all um, in, uh, restored and up to date and has beautiful gardens. And I walked in the woods nearby and then I heard about the ghost. And apparently you've got a ghost right here in B.B. Woods at Highfield Hall. And it's a woman and she's been seen in the uh, second floor windows 
She's been heard to walk down the stairs and people have attributed different uh, names to her, whether she's part, she's assumed to be part of the BB family who I think there were seven children from the, the parents and they had two big houses here, Tanglewood and Highfield Hall. And um, there were several deaths in the family that were suspicious or unfortunate. And what happened to uh, the person who died is that they come back. And they could be Emily Beebe, one of the daughters. They could be Mary Louisa Beebe, who died of stomach cancer in 1883 or something. So there, there are people in the family that seem to still be here. So that's sort of the background of your ghost right in Falmouth. And now we're going to travel across the water to uh, Martha's Vineyard. And we'll get there in just a moment. The book is now available at eight cousins across the way. And one of the book talks I did last fall, I met a ghost right here. At least she looked like a ghost. She had a sweatshirt on that said, I'm dead. And I said, that was too perfect. I couldn't let her get away without me taking her picture. And she posed holding the book. Um, didn't want to buy the book, but she was interested enough to be part of that. So what I'm going to do is talk about uh, different stories that I have uh, found out about. And each story that I share is believed by the people who shared it. And it's up to you to believe it or not. Now we start with the Daggett House. And this was built around 1660, right on North Water Street in Edgartown, which is the county seat. And it was built as an inn or a lodging place. It was known as an ordinary. And each town that uh, had a certain population, I believe, had to provide an ordinary for uh, travelers to be able to spend the night and to find something to eat. And the Daggett House was such an establishment right in Edgartown. And it served as an inn for not just generations, but centuries. I closed down in 2004. So it went from about 1660 for whatever that is, 250 years, and served very admirably as an inn. But it also had some background that um, made it a little bit suspicious, if you will. And there was a secret staircase in this uh, sort of family gathering room you can see where the door would be. There was a secret latch that would open the, the door to get into the staircase. And what was it used for? Well, <clears throat> on a historical note, Edgartown just got a, a recognition from the National Park Service as part of the Underground Railroad. So we knew that uh, slaves, escaped slaves, were transported to Martha's Vineyard, and some of them were uh, stayed here and then were moved on to New Bedford and on to Canada. But it's very likely that this secret staircase was used to house slaves, escaped slaves. Now that's, um, we don't have any proof of that because of course the, uh, the uh, whole abolition movement was not something that was legal and it was not something that people wanted to promote, but it's very likely this was used for uh, hiding escaped slaves. Uh, other events that occurred here, there was a honeymoon couple that stayed in that, in the, they went up the staircase and there was a bedroom up there, the honeymoon suite, and this couple went up there and they never came down. They just disappeared. And that sort of sets the tone for the ghostly stories that come 
from the Daggett House. Um, if you look closely at the fireplace, you are supposed to be able to see uh, the ghosts of two little boys and they had a dog and one of them hid the dog from the other boy in the secret staircase. And for some reason, the dog didn't bark, the boy didn't get him out and uh, the dog died in there. And then the boys eventually died. And so it's a, a little bit of a sad story of what happened to them. And it's all in the uh, image in the fireplace of that photograph. Can you go there today? Unfortunately, the inn closed in 2004, but I did talk to the person who owned it, um, Jim Churguin, and he said that uh, he, ran, he and his family had run the place for something like 50 years, and he had heard ghost stories, but he thought the ghost stories were just drummed up by uh, the innkeeper to try to get more business. But you and I know where there's a story, there's something else going on. Now behind the Daggett house was a boathouse and this boathouse was moved about a half mile away after the inn closed. And I was in touch with the person who rented uh, out the boathouse one year, and she didn't see any ghosts, but she did have several stories about strange sounds. Upstairs, there were footsteps. Upstairs, there were closets that would open and close by themselves. And the, the thing that amazed her the most, it seems like a little thing, but if it really happened, it's kind of cool. And she uh, was big on recycling. And she put several cans outside the door to recycle in the morning. And when she got up the next morning, the cans were arranged in a very set pattern, very different from just being discarded out there. They were put in a certain way. She took a lot of pictures of the house and when she moved out, her computer died and she lost all the pictures. So you know there's something going on there. This is the Anchors. It's the senior center in Edgartown. <clears throat> it's a building uh, that is right on Edgartown Harbor. The harbor's to our right here. It was built around 1900. And I want you to look at the third floor the left-hand window that's missing a shutter. And that is the notorious yellow room. <clears throat> and what makes the yellow room interesting is that a person who has worked here, I talked to several people who work here, they all agree that there is a presence. There's a figment of something that is in this yellow room. Here's the yellow room and it's on the third floor. <clears throat> there is a young man who works here. We're not quite sure what he does. He may be working on model ships. He seems frustrated. He's struggling. He's trying to get something done. Now, the person who has seen him has worked at Anchors for over 20 years and she's uh, clinically inclined. So she looks at this image that she's seen probably four times over the 20 years. And she says that he seems uh, both mentally and physically challenged. So she wants to help him, but it's not something where she can really interact with him. She just is aware he was there, he's there. She looks at ghosts as kind of a, um, a, a physical power, an energy that is left when someone passes away, like a fingerprint, that they have lived and died in this um, building. And what 
what has become of them is that they, um, they don't know whether they're alive or dead. And so they're sort of in an in-between state. Now there's another view of ghosts that certain people can see them and other people can't. And this woman obviously can see them. Um, she says she is not afraid of, afraid of them. There's no reason to fear them, but it is a little bit unworldly. And she works in an office one floor down. She doesn't like to be the last one out of the building. She doesn't like to look upstairs when she leaves. And she hears strange sounds, footsteps, sometimes moving furniture. And there's no office upstairs on this third floor. There's nobody who works up there. It's just a storage area, empty rooms. And yet there's something going on there. Now we move to another building. These are all right near Edgartown Harbor, right near the water, which may have something to do with how ghosts continue to exist. But the Kelly House uh, dates back to 1742. Um, <clears throat> there are several strange stories about this. If you look at the lower left corner of the um, building. It's a brick um, room. It's a, a pub. It's called the News from America. And it's, if you come to Edgartown, it's a great place to just get in, go in and have a beer, have something to eat, and you enjoy the atmosphere. Um, the rest of the place is a hotel, and it recently changed hands. Um, but we'll start with the hotel part that uh, there's a room number 308 that uh, apparently is inhabited by a female ghost and the people who work at the news from America, the pub, they say that, that this woman, they call her Helen. They think of her as a widow of a whale man that she's waiting for her husband to come home. Um, he doesn't come home, she's still waiting for him. She's anguished, she's lonely, and she sometimes um, acts out. Two um, interesting incidents about, or three in incidents about the hotel. Um, I checked on TripAdvisor about the Kelly House and I found a woman who stayed here in 2014. She was in room 308, middle of the night, Helen, the ghost, apparently appeared. This woman was horrified, scared, frightened, and uh, complained to management. I don't know whether it was at right then or the next morning, um, but she was offered a free meal at the um, pub downstairs and she went to a different room and that was um, all well and good from her perspective she said don't stay in room 308. Now another person uh, Stephanie Barnhart has a blog about different aspects of life and she wrote about staying in one of the uh, uh, the suites at the Kelly House. There's a couple of other um, areas where people can uh, rent a room. And she said everything was great until four o'clock in the morning. And all of a sudden she heard sounds of people moving furniture upstairs. And she was just awakened, annoyed, scared, didn't know quite what was going on, found it very disturbing. And I don't know if that was room 308, but she just would not come back to the Kelly house. A third example of what happened was that they wanted to do a ghost uh, search of sounds and, and uh, to see if there were any ghosts there. And 
a group of like 25 people came over with those electronic machines to, to record ghost sounds and they went through the place and the wind was whistling and people were talking so they didn't really hear anything but they did make an effort to try to find out what was going on there. Now we're going to go to the news from America and just see if we can um, Kelly House downstairs, the news from America. The bar is friendly, convivial. You go there with a bunch of people and it's a fun place. But sometimes the lights flicker and you don't really know what's wrong, whether it's a loose light bulb or a plug or whatever. Two bartenders told me they'd had experiences where wine glasses had flown off the shelf just like that, bounced onto the floor and cracked. Another thing that shot across the floor was a, the ball from a Christmas ornament, a wreath that fell on the floor and it boomed across the room and boomed back and it was very startling. The waitresses I spoke to were not alarmed, they were amused by it. And then one of them said that she had seen Helen. Helen is the widow from upstairs and she stood right by the fireplace in the um, news from America and just sort of stood there with an image sort of fluttering a little bit and then disappeared. But she was, she had long stringy white hair, a light blue dress and a little bit disconcerting to see someone like that. We go up the street to the Victorian, which is a three-story hotel on South Water Street. It's now called the Christopher. Um, I talked to somebody who stayed there on their honeymoon in over uh, 4th of July in the year 2000. And this fellow is very reputable. He's the assistant superintendent of schools of Martha's Vineyard. He and his wife stayed in the um, a room on the third floor. Um, he admits that he's um, obsessive compulsive. He's got to lock the door three times. He's got to, you know, check his watch every two minutes, all of that sort of stuff. So he and his new bride were going out for a walk. They uh, locked the French doors. They made sure the bathroom was neat. They um, made their own bed and they straightened out the little table with a vase of flowers. They went out, came back a couple hours later. The French door was wide open. The towels that they had hung on the bathroom uh, racks were flung on the floor. The vase of flowers that they'd straightened and put on the table was moved to the side. And the rug that was under their four poster bed had been picked up and twisted 90 degrees, moved 90 degrees, which meant you basically had to pick up the bed and move the rug. You can't do that with one person. You need about four people to do that. So they checked with housekeeping, they checked with management. Nobody knew anything about it. Nobody had done anything. They carry that memory 20 years later. This is Atria, a very um, high-end high restaurant in Upper Main Street. I uh, got word that the proprietor um, had some ghost stories. I talked to her very, um, a, a very brief conversation, but she was so specific, I took her at her word. She said they bought the place around 2000 and the, uh, the first few weeks that they were there, she was working one night, late at night by herself and she heard a voice right in her ear saying her name. There was nobody else there. There was no telephone ringing or anything. It was just her name right there. 
Uh, about six years later, she had to go into the restaurant at, uh, in the middle of winter and she brought her two labs in. She had to get something out of the kitchen. She started to walk toward the kitchen. The dogs refused to go forward. She opened the door of the kitchen and all this screaming was going on, shouts and screams. She dashed in, took out what she needed, closed the doors. The dogs were like quivering and she left. The third thing that happened, happened two years ago. She was on the second floor. She looked downstairs and an image of somebody something. She couldn't tell whether it was a man or a woman, but it was a person walking across the walkway at the bottom of the stairs. Now the, the restaurant was closed, the doors were locked. Um, who was it? She isn't sure to this day. I hope none of you have the opportunity to go into this fine building. This is the Egertown um, Jail, the Dukes County House of Correction, and it's been around for a hundred and something years. It's got granite walls uh, 18 inches wide. Um, it's, it's a pretty formidable place inside. And we'll look inside for just a minute because some strange things have been going on in here. Um, there were sounds of water dripping. There were sounds of typewriters clicking. There were lights that flickered. And just a general sense of disconcer disconcerting things happening. Inside the jail here, um, some of the uh, on-duty officers have heard these strange things. They've been working at a desk and they hear footsteps of somebody coming toward them. They turn around, nobody's there. And perhaps the most exciting thing that happened or unsettling thing that happened was that they had a security camera that caught somebody running across the day room and yet all the inmates were locked in their cells. Now there's a story that there's a inmate who um, committed suicide in 1950. His name was Old Joe, and they wonder if Old Joe is still walking the hallways. Now um, there are two or three groups that do uh, tours of ghosts in Egertown. Um, well, they do it in Egertown, Vineyard Haven, and Oak Bluffs. And these are some pictures that were given to me about some of the images they've seen. Of course, the problem with the ghost is they're not going to stay around for a photograph. So um, you have to take this for what it's worth. Uh, you all know about the uh, campground, the Camp Meeting Association. If you, um, if you see the cover of my book, this is the house that we put on the cover. This is the house of um, Bishop Haven, who, was, who hosted President Ulysses S. Grant when he visited the vineyard in 1874. I don't have ghost stories about this house because the woman who told me a ghost story about the campground wouldn't tell me specifically which house it was, but I know it was near this one on Clinton Avenue. <clears throat> Her story is, she's about my age, a little younger maybe, but um, a number of years ago, she, as a college student, she came down for her family to um, open up the house for the summer. She came with a girlfriend and they spent the time uh, cleaning the house, dusting, opening windows and all of that. And then they went to bed and they slept in two twin beds. And in the middle of the night, Susan heard, saw, felt the presence 
of an older woman in the room. She called out to her friend, go back to bed, go to sleep. Her friend was fast asleep in the other bed. This woman brushed against Susan's bed. She ruffled the, the covers a little bit. She walked right through the room and went up the stairs. Now, Susan had two or three other stories about this woman, and we're not quite sure who it was, but um, the family had bought the house from an elderly woman, and the woman moved to Florida, and she passed away, and the, Susan found out about her death, and the spirits stopped bothering her. So there may be a connection between the death and the ghosts. Now we go over to Vineyard Haven. Uh, this is the oldest school on Martha's Vineyard, the Tisbury School, built in 1929, over 90 years old. And when it was being built, uh, there was a, a couple of there were a couple of uh, workers on the third floor of the structure, of the, um, the, the framing of the building. And a storm was coming and one of the men had to lay out a tarpaulin or something over the work that had been done. He slipped and fell to his death, to three stories down and died just like that. Now, that was 1929. Um, in the 40s and 50s, there was a uh, there were stories about Scotty, who was a custodian, who um, was thought to be a ghost, a ghost of this original fellow who had passed away, and students would talk about him. Uh, the other custodians had heard about him, and someone had seen him. And they, uh, they even had a classroom closet where Scotty was supposed to hang out. Lots of stories here that can be embellished, but there's a basic image that people hold on to that it has some interest to it. This is Donna Humphreys. Um, she is the daughter of the Humphrey family that uh, had a bakery starting in the 1940s. She's now running Life at Humphreys, which is right in Vineyard Haven. And her story is kind of uh, cute, if you will. She um, grew up on the vineyard and her grandparents had this house at the corner of North Road and State Road in West Tisbury. And as a young girl, she came to visit her grandparents and she was in the kitchen with her grandmother baking something, I'm sure. And the grandmother had her focus on the uh, counter and Donna turned to her left and there was a gentleman standing there and he was very well dressed. He had a top hat, and tails, and he had a silver tray in his hand holding it out. And Donna was not frightened, but she was curious. She turned to her grandmother and said, who's that? And they both turned back and this image had disappeared. And later Donna found out that the family used to have a butler and his name was Dan Baxter. And you can talk to Donna today. She believes that Don Baxter came back as a ghost and he was right there when she was eight years old, she got to see him. Now we take a quick trip back in history. This is called Redcoat Hill. It's a place in Vineyard Haven where it's a hillside that's high enough that if there weren't trees there, you could take a look and see Vineyard Haven Harbor. Now, you guys in Falmouth had the Nimrod come over in the War of 1812 and fire a cannon at Falmouth. Well, we had British warships here in the winter, in the fall of 1778, 
and they were here to capture or take away or steal our sheep. They had 40 warships into the harbor and they negotiated with the people of Vineyard Haven. They said, we won't uh, attack you. All we want is your sheep. We want to take all your sheep down to New York so we can feed the redcoats through the winter, which was 1778. 10,000 sheep were marched down island from Chilmark, from Aquinnah, from West Tisbury, and they were loaded aboard the British ships and sent off to New York. Now, to make sure that happened, a number of British regulars and British officers stayed at this house in West Tisbury. This is the Josiah uh, Standish house built in 1660 by the son of Miles Standish. And in the fall of 1778, there were a bunch of British officers who were here and they were making sure that the local farmers put all their sheep on the roadway and march them down to the harbor, 20 miles in some cases. Now that's 1778. Now travel back uh, forward in time to the mid 1990s. And this uh, Josiah's uh, Standish house was then a, um, an inn, a bed and breakfast. And there were people staying there. And one night, <clears throat> a gentleman got up. We'll go to the next slide because that's where things are. <clears throat> and he was walking from the uh, left-hand side of the house to the right-hand side of the house. He had to go past the big living room. And as he went past the living room, this is the middle of the night, he saw a whole group of British redcoats they were partying, they were enjoying themselves, singing and drinking. And he thought, well, this is quite a party going on. And he didn't think that much more about it. But the next morning he asked the, uh, the innkeeper uh, if there was a party for the British or actors dressed up as British soldiers. There was no party, there was no play. They were the ghosts from the British who had been here 200 years before. You gotta believe it. Now we go up to Windy Gates. This is a uh, luxury house that was built in the 1880s. And, <coughs> excuse me, a woman named Lucy Sanford poured all kinds of money into this to make it very special. Um, the house looks more like this today. And um, the Lucy was just, she was a little bit loose upstairs and she wanted to have her pig be very comfortable so she would have a light, an electric light put in his thigh. And she would change designs for rooms and change this and she did a lot of weird things. Well, over the last 20 or so years, there have been sightings of strange people around Windy Gates. And some of them are dressed in what they call masterpiece theater uh, attire. So this is the story of Windy Gates. We have just a couple more to do, and then we're gonna open it up to questions or chats or comments. Part of a whole ghost story is that there was an unintended death, a tragedy, something that happened that wasn't expected. And the person who goes through that um, lives on as a ghost. Some people consider the ghost to be like the negative of a black and white photograph. Some people, as I said, consider it like an energy source or a uh, fingerprint. Well, in 1928, a little four-year-old girl fell into a well and drowned out in, Chum in Aquina. And this is the, um, the Aquina Cultural Center today. 
but it was a house that was built by the Vanderhoops, by Edwin Vanderhoop, who was our state representative. And the house, um, you know, today it looks fine. It looks out over the water. It's a beautiful setting, but it has this tragedy of the four-year-old girl drowning. And I talked to two uh, women who stayed here before it was the cultural center. They stayed here when it was open for, for roommates and stuff. And both of them, they, they didn't know each other, but they had, and they stayed here at different times, but they both had experiences of the sightings of the little girl. There were strange things where there were sounds of footsteps, sounds of people walking that, that when there was nobody there and things that happened like somebody's bureau had all the stuff uh, pushed off to the side. Uh, someone had a, a, what seemed like the image of a dog that they saw and there were no dogs around. So there were a lot of sort of unusual incidents associated with this. Now from the Vanderhoop house, you can look out at the, the glory of the ocean beyond um, in the book, I have a number of sea monsters and, <coughs> excuse me, ocean-going adventures. I have a couple of mutinies that I talk about. Anything that is strange or unusual that we can't quite explain makes the story come alive. I also talk about cemeteries, graveyards, and what happens when people move on to the great unknown. Uh, there was a story in the Boston Globe about the West Tisbury Library. Um, back in something like 1939, there was a, two women were at the cemetery at night and this white light was right above the gravestones, bright enough that they could read the writing on the stones. And that was a little unusual, made the front page of the Globe. So, we're winding down now. This is Ghost of Martha's Vineyard. The book is available at um, Eight Cousins, and I'm happy to entertain any questions or comments. Um, here's a picture of me with gravestone talking about I do cemetery tours and my information for contact, Thomas Dresser at Gmail or thomasdresser.com. So I thank you for your interest, and I hope that you are able to sleep well tonight. I'm um, happy to answer anything that people have about uh, what may be of interest to you or that I can help you with. So thank you for the time of chatting with you. Thank you, Tom. That was great. Um, uh, uh, th in this particular case, normally we'd, I would say use the chat feature down below. But we, we did something last week that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow, we're going to try it again this time too, Tom. So as, as co-host, if, if you want to actually put your, um, um, your video on, and I'll let you raise your hands because some of these, because usually I make you type your questions out. But this time, if it, uh, something like this, if you want to raise your hand and you got a question, you can unmute yourself. Tom, Tom can call on you. He can be the, the, the teacher and call on you and you can raise your, raise, your, um, raise your hand and he can answer your question. But Tom, I'll start. And um, uh, you, at the top of it, you kind of said that you were a little bit um, skeptical and I will fully confess that I'm a tremendous skeptic. I'm the great non-believer. Uh, you know, I, I, I kind of need a um, a ghost to grab me by the lapels and slap me across the chops and and, and then I'm probably all in. But um, what, when you, how did you solicit these stories? And as you were listening to them, what was, what was going through your mind? Were you skeptical? Were, were you, as the process went on, were you changed from being a skeptic and you're, you're more, open-minded now? How, how did that work for you? Well, I've, I've interviewed a number of people over the years, so I have a little bit of a background of people's sincerity 
and authenticity. And I, I may also be very gullible, but what I found interesting was that I would ask people something and get an answer, and then I could go back and, and refresh it with them like a week or two later and get the same story without any embellishment, without any um, supplemental thing. It was like, this is what happened to me. I believe it. And I'm telling you because you're empathetic and you're listening, but I don't want to be considered a kook. I don't think I'm crazy. Um, you know, the, some of the young waitresses at the, the News from America, they, you know, they're serving people beer night after night, but they saw this ornament roll across the floor and then bounce back. They were there when the wine glasses crashed on the floor. Um, there, there are numerous other stories that, that sort of um, come from that. I also, that you ask sort of how did I get into, how did I find these people? It's word of mouth. You sort of put yourself out there. You're into ghosts. Well, you know, somebody heard from somebody and, you know, we had a, just a background is that we had a woman, Holly Nadler, who was considered the ghost lady of Martha's Vineyard because she had done a lot of research on ghosts for, since the 90s and ran ghost tours and stuff. So I, I picked her brain a bit and she's got a couple of books on it, but I didn't use her ghosts. I didn't have to re repeat every, virtually everything I did, I found on my own or found from somebody telling me about something. So, um, you know, it was just fascinating to get a, a handle on all these different different stories. And just to, just to bring you up to date that um, my wife and I were driving south last March, just a year ago, and the pandemic was coming in from, you know, the news reports. And I had this interview I wanted to do in South Carolina, in Charleston. And I met this woman who is a paranormal, who told me about the, the whole thing with photograph negatives and stuff of ghosts. And we had a nice little interview. And then I got in the car and we drove home over directly from Charleston because that was the end of the end of normalcy. But I got my interview in. And then when we were back here, we were able to confirm and add to things. So it's out there. The stuff is out there. You just have to dig a little bit. All right, if you got a question for Tom, just uh, uh, yeah, raise your hand and he'll, he'll call on you. Okay, Deborah. Mm -hmm. Hi, hi. So um, are there any uh, references to any of these houses in the Martha's Vineyard Gazette? Is there anything ever mentioned? Even the death of that little girl, are there any little scraps that are in the newspaper archives? Absolutely, yes. Um, in fact, some of these stories came from the Gazette. Um, it, was t it was purchased in 1919 or something by Henry Beadle Huff, who's the father, I think, of Bill Huff, who ran the Felmouth Enterprise. And yeah. you know, not the father, the uncle. Um, but anyway, Henry Huff, over in the early 20s, and in the 30s, he, he got into ghosts and there were several stories that he printed and then years later reprinted. And I dug up some of those that were, you know, strange sightings or strange things that happened. And that clip of the little girl in the, um, in the cistern, that's from the 1928 Gazette. So, and the, the story about the jail, all those sights and sounds, mm -hmm. I wanted to have an update on it, but that was a story that was printed in 1990. And I talked to the photographer who took the picture of the jail, but, um, and he confirmed, he said it was absolutely true, but I tried to talk to the sheriff and I tried to talk to other deputies and no one returned my call. So 
I went with the newspaper because I figured they were, you know, they checked it out. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. that's great. Thanks. Thank you. Another question? I mean, I can keep talking, but Mark said to try to keep it to this time frame, so. We, well, you may have done too too good of a job of telling people their ghost stories. So, so you, you, you got everyone staying up all night. Ah. <laughs> so I, I can ask another question, okay? Anything about the cemetery to share? Any specifics about the cemetery? Okay. <laughs> I've not been to the cemetery on Martha's Vineyard. I've been to our cemetery in Falmouth, but. Okay, my internet is getting weird. Ah. Okay, can you say that again? Um, I was wondering if you had any um, specific uh, scraps, pieces, stories from the cemetery. Yes, that was in the Boston Globe. And it was- Yeah, but other things that you know, because you are, you, you do the tours, are there other stories about the oh, cemetery oh, 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 other than yes. the light? Yes, well, I've done, um, especially in the, um, I've done Oak Grove Cemetery, which is, we have two Oak Grove cemeteries, believe it or not, but one of them is in Oak Bluffs. And I, um, I just talk about some of the people there, like there's a, a Native American who was a whaling person and what he, um, he rescued a more, it, it's not really a ghost story, it's more just a, a human interest story that um, he used to collect whaling shanties. And then when he died, his um, nephew or somebody threw the book of all the whaling shanties in the dump. But somebody heard about that before they were thrown, they were destroyed and got over to the dump and rescued them and turned it into a book. And it was Gail Huntington. And it was just sort of fascinating how, uh, how that story evolved. Then I've done Abel's Hill up in Chilmark. And there's a woman there, Elsie Fenner, who supposedly was a Went mute, went mute, Tom. Tom, you went mute. Okay, Elsie um, Fenner, a woman in the buried in the Abel's Hill Cemetery, uh, supposedly is still alive years after her death. And she um, is up and uh, walking around a house and people have seen her. And it's, I talked to her nephew who hadn't heard that ghost story, but it was interesting to hear his perspective that it's certainly possible. She's the sort of person I remember that could still be alive even after her death. So. You do hear these stories and it's kind of fun. It's fun, but it's also a little bit eerie because we don't really know. I wanted to have pictures of ghosts, but obviously I ain't got them. It was mostly houses that you can see, but the stories are in the house. That's what's neat. Another question. Well, Tom, I want to thank you for doing this tonight. I can tell that the the uh, the spirit world is starting to play gremlins on your on your internet. So, you, <laughs> so, 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 so when next time you do a net lecture, you can say you're now two for two. That, uh, that right, right. Yeah. That's good. That, that, this this adds to the lore. So um, yeah, well, uh, I'm, so, I'm so, glad so, we got so, most of this in. Yeah, so. that, that, there you go. Well, yeah. thank you for doing this. Um, I, yeah. I really appreciate it. Thanks for. Uh, uh, for for 
I don't know, do, do we say you're across the pond when you're on the vineyard? I mean, it's, it's not, it's, you know. Um, uh, so, uh, um, so thank you everybody for joining us tonight. And so before the, before the spirit world uh, takes Tom away from us, um, <laughs> Uh, the book is The Ghost of Martha's Vineyard. It's available at Eight Cousins. Um, Tom, good luck with this book. Thank you for joining us tonight. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you, uh, thank you everyone. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.